Hey, everybody. This is Adam Marcus, the writer-director of Jason Goes to Hell and Secret Santa and the writer of Texas Chainsaw 3D. And you are watching Slasher Pepper. Enjoy. <laughs> hey, you guys, Slasher Pepper, and welcome to another video. Today, I'm going to be interviewing Adam Marcus, the writer and director of Jason Goes to Hell. Hey, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good. How about you? Yeah. Very well. Very well, thanks. Glad to be here. Definitely. It's, it's, uh, I just realized that it's also the 40th anniversary of the first fire. The third day. So today. Yep. Yeah. This is the day I was, uh, and I was there not only for the opening of the movie, but I was there when they shot the movie. So, um, I was, you know, nine, but, uh, oh, but I was there. So. Really? Oh yeah. What was it like being on set of the first fire 13th film? It was awesome. I my um when I, I when I was growing up, my best friend. Uh, by the way, if you hear if you hear some some dogs in the background, those are my boys. They're running around. Um, so, okay. So forgive that, but uh, my my hellhounds. Um, uh, yeah. But when uh, no, when I was a kid, my best friend was this was this guy uh, Noel Cunningham, and his father is Sean S. Cunningham, <clears throat> and so. Um, I was really, you know, running around everything they did for all of those years right at the beginning of, of Sean's heyday of filmmaking. So uh, it was cool. It was really cool, man. Like, you know, getting to meet all those people and see. It was my first introduction to actual physical filmmaking. And it's really what gave me the bug to want to make movies. Um, I just thought it was the most exciting thing I'd ever seen. Yeah, I can imagine being like a nine year old running around on set. That would be great. Um, were you on any of the other sequels uh, sets or besides no. the first one, just on the Jason no, Goes to Hell, obviously? Just the first one and then Jason Goes to Hell because, you know, what most people don't realize, Sean Cunningham, the guy who produced and directed the first film, he had nothing to do with the sequels. Literally zero. He just got a check every time they made one. Um, right. So they would consult him. They would talk to him about stuff. Uh, but he he had nothing to do with those movies. Part nine, mine, uh, Jason Goes to Hell, is the is the first one that he actually made after the uh, after the first movie. So he went from one to nine. Right. Yeah, I forgot that he doesn't work. Didn't really work on the other ones. So your friend couldn't really bring you over to the other sets. No, I mean Sean's protege, Steve Miner, directed part two and three. And Sean's wife, his his deceased former wife, um, Susan, was the editor of part two. Um, and so so there was a tenuous connection because there were people that he knew or that he lived with that worked on those films. But he did not produce those movies. He did not make those films. Right. That's the first yeah. one. Okay. First one, nine, ten and Jason versus Freddie. He was the producer on. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. OK. Uh, and can we expect any new projects from yourself? Oh, for me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've, I've, I've been doing, I, I've, I've been working pretty consistently since the movie. Um, I, I noticed your, your awesome t-shirt and, uh, yeah, <laughs> damn Skippy. Uh, and so my wife, Deborah, who's my writing partner, the two of us, um, you know, we did, uh, uh Texas Chainsaw 3D. That was us. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I've done a bunch of other other films. I mean, most of what I'm known for is, is my horror stuff. But, you know, I had a huge romantic comedy um, hit with a movie called Let It Snow uh, back in the early 2000s. Um, and uh, and then, you know, I did a, a, a action film with Val Kilmer that I directed called Conspiracy. Uh, that was that was a real experience. Um, and, uh, and just a couple of years ago, my wife and I, and, uh, my best friend, a guy named Brian Sexton, the three of us created, uh, Skeleton Crew. And the Skeleton Crew is, um, is a production company that has three divisions. We have a TV division, a large budget division, and my, my baby, which is the, the ultra low budget division, um, which is sort of, uh, kind of a reinvention of what Roger Corman used to do. Um, which is have budgets that are really, really tight, but allow a filmmaker's voice to come through. And so the first film out of that division uh, came out last year uh, called uh, Secret Santa, which is yeah. a uh, horror yeah. comedy that um, that did incredibly well. We were all over the world with it. We, we've uh, we've sold it to most most of the world. Um, but, you know, it did 20, 22 festivals. We won a ton of awards and. Uh, 
and, and it's it's the movie I'm proudest of, even though I made it for next to nothing. Um, and I made it with my uh, troop of actors. I've been I've been in the last uh, couple decades. I've been teaching um, actors in L.A. Okay. I, have my own, I have my own studio out here. And uh, and to that end. Um, because I wanted, I, I came from the theater. I came from, I, I was, I was a Broadway kid and I, I was that kid. And, and so I love the theater and in film, you tend to not have troops of actors. You might have actors that get together and work on movies together. That's fine. But I missed the, the, the feeling of working with a troop of, of performers, uh, like a theater company. And so over the last 20 years, I've, I've created that. Um, so I've got 60 actors that I work with every week. Um, and Secret Santa is literally the entire film is populated with nothing but people who are part of my troupe. Um, wow, that's cool. It is cool. It is cool. Yeah, and it, you feel like you're going to summer camp when you go to make a movie. Um, it's, it's awesome. And you're working with people you love, which is the point of Skeleton Crew. I, I, I got tired of working with people that not only didn't, I didn't like, but that I, that I actively disliked. And um, right. yeah. I just life's too short. Like I want to I want to work with people that I that I love that I love to work with. Um, and so that's where that all came about. So it's it's been magical thus far. I am. Uh, let's see. We have a we have a movie coming out of our big budget division this year through Lionsgate. Um, I can't say who the star is yet because we're literally just finishing their paperwork right now. But it's a big <laughs> movie star. Um, so that one's really exciting uh, called Velocity. Um, and that's an action thriller. Um, then we have a new TV series that's coming, and we have uh, three um, lower-budgeted movies coming out, out of the Skeleton Crew division. Okay. Um, uh, and they're, they're, they're all uh, genre-friendly. So we have one movie call, uh, coming out called Fat Camp Massacre. <laughs> and that's why it's that's, called that Fat Camp Massacre. That sounds like my kind of movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, it's amazing. Um, and the, the, the great thing about Fat Camp Massacre, because part of the point of Skeleton Crew is that I don't want to just I don't want to just make movies. I don't I don't want to just churn stuff out. Every movie has to have some sort of um, political bent to it. And I don't mean that in like politics. I mean, um, you know, if you watch like George Romero's older films, if you look at Night of Living Dead, that movie is really about the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And yeah. a lot of people just go like, oh, that's a cool zombie movie. Yes, it's a great zombie movie. It's the best zombie movie, but it's about something. You look at Dawn of the Dead and suddenly he's talking about American consumerism run amok. And so there are these great lessons being taught in the movie. Like you're getting your vegetables even though you think you're eating dessert. Right, yeah. <laughs> And that's kind of the point of Skeleton Crew is that we want to give people something that's a little more <laughs> nutritious for your brain than just, you know, blood and guts and screaming. And we want you to have all the blood and guts and screaming, but we want it to come with something that means something. So Fat Camp Massacre is really an anti-bullying, anti-body anti dysmorphia movie um, where, you know, like the, one of the last bastions of, of things that we can make fun of people, at least in our country about is their size. Um, mm -hmm. there's a tremendous amount of sizeism that goes on in this country. And, um, and the victims of that are, are, it's a tremendous number of people who are of size and it doesn't matter what size or how that size fits, but that they are made to feel less than because of it. And the, the tagline of this movie is get ready for the real Hunger Games. Uh, <laughs> and it's uh, so it's, you know, it's got a lot in its mind. It's definitely got a sense of humor. It's not a comedy, but it's got a, it's it's got a good sense of humor and it's a pretty brutal movie. Um, so that's one of the things we're doing. Um, we have uh, we have a wonderful project called um, This Perfect Day, which is um sort of a, a beautiful wedding movie mixed with Jacob's Ladder. So you've got a bride who is, um, who could be seeing things that are monsters around her, or she could just be a paranoid schizophrenic, but you're not sure which. Um, and it's sort of the day of her wedding when all of this stuff snaps. Um, so we're, we're, that one I'm directing. Um, so yeah, we're we're doing um, we're doing a lot of cool, really cool 
fun, scary stuff right now. Um, and doing it, you know, again, shooting the way Skeleton Crew likes to shoot, which is a tiny crew, um, remarkable actors that some you haven't seen, some you have seen, um, and really giving uh, giving a platform for new kinds of storytelling. So that's that's what we're what we're doing. That's really great. Yeah, nice. I like the fact that you kind of just don't want to push out a horror, another horror movie, but also want to like actually give it a message to it. You know? Yes. Yep. Yeah. And honestly, look, you know, I, I feel like our genre to some degree, like we have two types of movies now in our genre, either stuff where people are hearkening back to stuff that happened in the 1970s and the 1980s, which I understand the nostalgia for it. I mean, but quite frankly, do we need more Halloween movies? Really? Do we? Do we? Not so much. Um <laughs> And, and I feel like a lot of the air is taken up for new ideas, for new kinds of movies. The other thing is I find, and I think this, I think this is simply because of, of the way society feels right now. I feel like everybody is really depressed and angry and I get it like coronavirus, political system. I, I get all that, but I feel like all of our horror movies now are just dread. There's nothing but like, oh. And horror movies used to be fun. Like you exactly. went to, yeah. right? And now they're not such a good time anymore. Now they're just really like depressing and oh my God. And it, it's funny, I was, I was truly just talking, I don't know if you know this guy. Um, he's one of my closest friends my whole life, this guy, John Esposito. John wrote uh, Stephen King's Graveyard Shift. Um, he was a producer on From Dust Till Dawn. He's uh, he won the uh, the Writers Guild Award for The Walking Dead two years in a row. I mean, he's he's a journeyman writer. And he's he's a genius. And he and I were literally just talking about this uh, yesterday. And I said, I said, John, I said, remember back in the in the eighties and nineties? I said, did we ever write a movie where the lead character? where their, their parents had committed suicide or died horribly before the film started. Like, we ever do that? He's like, no. I said, and it's amazing. Every single horror movie, someone has died this hideous, tragic death before the, before the story even starts. So the lead is always <laughs> like, you know, just yeah. the <laughs> like, I'm like, we, our horror movies used to be like, we're going to summer camp. And then they'd get slaughtered. <laughs> You know, but they were like, they were happy. And so I, I just, I, now it's like, it's sad. And then they get slaughtered. I'm like, okay. Um, so to some degree, Skeleton Crew is trying to bring back a little bit of that feeling that people love from those movies without making those movies, without having to go back to the old icons. Uh, because again, I, I don't know how much more hockey mask the world needs. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's the same thing over and over again. It's just like a tired record over yes. and over again. You know? Yes, which is why Jason Goes to Hell was so different. Um, mm -hmm. Because I, I just, you know, Sean Cunningham, first, Sean Cunningham did not want the hockey mask in the movie. He hated the hockey mask. He thought that was a dumb idea. Um, and then, and so he told me, get the hockey mask out of the movie. And in doing that, it freed me to kind of create a mythology for the film and to try new stuff. I mean, the fun of Jason Goes to Hell is it's a monster movie. It's like the first real Friday 13th monster movie. I mean, for God's sakes, I make them, there's a guy who melts in the middle of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, like, I'm like, show me that in another Friday, you know? So that's kind of the feeling is that I, I, I wanted it to be um, different. And, uh, you know, and, and to some degree, that's the curse of my career is that I've always wanted to strive for different when there's a lot of horror fans who just want the same thing over and over yeah. again. You know, they want to go to well, McDonald's all the time. I mean, the fact that Jason Goes to Hell is so different is the reason that it stands out to me. Thank I mean, you. I even love Jason X. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people hate me for saying that, but I, I mean, it's, it's different, you know? Yeah, it totally it's is. It's not just another Canva movie. It, have you ever gotten to read the original screenplay of Jason X? Uh, no, no. Okay, if you can get your hands on a copy, uh, I'm sure there's one online, but Todd Farmer wrote a really good screenplay. It's really good. It's even, it's way better than the movie they produced. And by the way, I think Jason X has its charms as well. I agree with you. Um, 
But there's stuff in the script that is so absolutely bonkers and great, like really, really great. Um, and I think the movie that he and Jimmy Isaacs wanted to make wasn't the movie they ended up getting to make. Uh, but it's it's really cool. You should check it out. I think you can dig it. All right. I'll, uh, that's noted, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you have any other concepts in your mind when writing Jason Goes to Hell? Or was it always... Uh the concept that turned out as a movie? Um, it was pretty similar. Um, wh what we started with, the opening was different, um, and it involved uh, who was, at that point, Jason's brother, Elias Voorhees, who then ended up becoming his father. We ended up using the name Elias to be Jason's dad. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, it was pretty similar. The one big difference was the lead of the movie was supposed to be Tommy Jarvis. Uh, oh, right. yeah. And, and I wasn't allowed to use the I wasn't allowed to use the character. Uh, Par Paramount had only sold New Line the rights to Jason Voorhees and everything that was in the first screenplay. So right. we could use all those tropes. We couldn't use anything from part four or six. Um, but I, I originally had written it for, for it to be Tommy. Right. OK. Yeah, that makes sense. Like Paramount and, uh, you know, New Line Cinema. Yeah. And um, do you have any fond memories of the Jason Goes to Hell set? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I, I, look, I was 23 years old when I directed that movie. Um, and it was like a playground to me. Like, there was, there was nothing cooler. Like, you're 23, I'm a couple years out of film school, and, uh, and I've got 100 people running around doing what I ask them to do, which is a crazy, a crazy experience at that age. Um, and because I had been doing theater for so long, I was used to having a full stage of people and all that. So that, was, that part of it was easy, but it was the idea that this is going to be in movie theaters. Like, this is going to be everywhere, this thing. Um, I can tell you, look, working with Kane was amazing, like consistently amazing. Um, he's such a badass. He's so funny and clever and, and just, just an incredible partner. And he was also my stunt coordinator on the film. So, um, so I was really blessed to have Kane. Um, I will tell you like one of my favorite stories from the set, even though it's, even though I got injured, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> so when we were going to blow up Jason, um, they had, they had rigged it with this, basically this exploding wire. Okay. Um, and this wire, it, they wrapped it around the, the fake Jason body. Right. And we're out in the middle of, uh, this giant parking lot with tree lines behind us. So it'll match where we shot him getting shot earlier in the film. And, uh, so we're going to blow up this body <clears throat> and my whole tech crew was like, you know, you want to stand back as far away from this because we put a lot of cord on this thing. Like, it's going to blow. <laughs> I'm 23, and I'm just freaking psyched that this is happening, that I'm blowing something up in a movie. Uh, and so I, I'm i closer than anybody else is to this thing. And my tech guys are like, Adam, you're really going to feel it. I was like, I want to feel it. I want to feel it. I want to feel the explosion. They're like, okay, but you're really going to feel it. I was like, okay. So I'm standing there holding, I've got my monitor in front of me, right? Which is on a C stand. Okay. Um, the yeah. explosion happens. The monitor goes flying into my chest and I go flying back against a van about 10 <laughs> feet back. Uh, boy, did I feel that explosion. It knocked me right on my ass. Um, so that was <laughs> awesome. That was, it was really cool. Like it ended, I was like, wow. Wow. And like all the tech people are running over to get me and stuff. I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. That was awesome. What are you kidding me? <laughs> um, right. So, uh, so yeah, that, that was amazing. Um, we, uh, there's the lovely woman, Julie Michaels, who plays agent Marcus at the beginning of the film, who, you know, the, the woman who, who, uh, who sets Jason up for the sting. And, yeah. um, and Julie, uh, is a stunt woman as well as an actor. Um, and she's a wonderful actor who does incredible stunts. And by the way, like Julie now has got a bunch of Emmys for her work as a stunt coordinator for television. She's incredible. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, she's really cool. Um, so Julie was really young. We were both, we were both really young. Uh, we were kids and she, um, 
we were doing the scene where she's running away from Jason through the woods. And uh, we shot it a couple times and we had these booties for her, but she didn't want to wear the booties because you would see them on camera. She wanted it to look clean uh, so that she had bare feet. So she's doing the run. And I said, Julie, we're going to go one more time. You okay? And she goes, oh, yeah, yeah, let's do it. So she walks away from me, but I notice that there's blood on the ground where she's walking. And I was like, Julie, stop. Show me your feet, kiddo. And she was like, no, 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 I'm fine. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I was like, no, show me your feet. So she lifted one of her feet. It was just shredded from running on the ground. like. And I was like, no. And she's like, Adam, I'm fine. I said, you're not fine. And I walked over and I scooped her up. I picked her up off the ground. And I walked her to the med tent to make sure they'd clean her up. And she was fine. They cleaned her up and then they put the booties on. So in the movie, you'll see there are shots where the booties are there, booties are not, booties are there, booties are not, because <laughs> I pieces from both takes. But that was sort of the beginning for me of what matters more. And honestly, what matters more always is your actor's safety. It's all that matters. <laughs> So um, it taught me a great lesson. And Julie and I, we're still really close friends. And we talk about that all the time. She's always, she jumps into my arms. She's like, my hero. And she jumps into my arms. Um, of course, now I'm like, God, all right. I'm not so, all right. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but no, they, uh, yeah, it, it was really, it was an amazing thing. Look, Jason Goes to Hell is also the first and only Friday the 13th where the director, myself, um, I had a rehearsal schedule for my actors and I rehearsed them for weeks before we shot anything, which to actors in a Friday 13th movie, they're like, wait, we're going to rehearse. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> like we're going to treat this like a piece of theater. We're going to work. Yeah. We're going to rehearse. Like I'm going to give you my time. If you want to come, let's do it. And it was incredible. I had my whole cast for months, two months before the shoot rehearsing their scenes. Um, which is unheard of in most movies, but really in a Friday Thirteenth movie, it, it it never happened. So, right, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it definitely shows in Jason Goes to Hell. I mean, in the others, like sometimes the acting is just so bad it's good, but in Jason Goes to Hell, it's actually pretty good, good especially for a Friday Thirteenth movie, you know. Yeah, and it's it's amazing when you look at the careers of those actors since they since they did that film. Um, the number of people, I mean, Stephen Williams is, you know, significant actor with a great list of credits, you know, Kane Hodder, of course. Um, but right. people like Rus Rusty Schwimmer, who came out of that movie, who's had an unbelievable career, Leslie Jordan, who is the lead of a TV series right now. I mean, it's like over and over again, the actors from that group of people have all gone on to have kind of amazing, amazing careers. Yeah, you see that a lot in horror movies, and I think that's really great. And definitely cool if you directed a film and then see your crew becoming like actually big stars, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like my favorite thing in the world. I, lo I love, say, yeah. I love, I love, I, I can't help that. Yeah. It's really awesome. It's really awesome. Um, so obviously in the film, you see the Necronomicon. Um, and was that just a gag or did you have any plans leading up to much, something much bigger in the future? Um, yeah, it was not a gag. That's for sure. Um, the reasoning behind it was, okay, so when I, when I, when I tack, when I started tackling the story of Jason Goes to Hell, my biggest problem with the Friday 13th franchise has always been that there's no consistency in the mythology of the movie. So in the first movie, you've got this kid who's been, who was killed in the fifties in 1980, he jumps out of the lake. He's still a kid. I know that because I went to school with Ari Lehman. Ari's only a couple years older than I am. So we were kids. So a kid jumps out of the water and drags Alice down. So there has been some mutant child living in the lake for 30 years now. Okay, fine. I'll take that. Like, he's a monster. Got it. Two weeks later is when Friday 13th Part 2 is supposed to happen. And suddenly, Jason has grown two feet. He's gained 140 pounds. <laughs> He's gotten a full set of clothes that he can wear. He must have learned to read because he had to look in the yellow pages to find out where Alice lived. He's learned to drive a car, driven the car to her house, killed her, brought mom's head with him, of course, killed her, then 
dragged her back to Crystal Lake to put her in his shrine. In two weeks, all of that happened. Right? Okay. Then, you know, you keep moving forward and, you know, look, you hit this guy with any kind of damage. You hack him up, you tear him up. He's not going to the doctor to get patched up between movies. And somehow he lives to part four. Great. Dead in part four. I always love when people talk about part six being when when zombie Jason happened. It's like, <laughs> who was he before? <laughs> right. He wasn't a person. Um, so then you get zombie Jason and, you know, and, and it just continues with this sort of like every movie has its own complete logic. So when I did Jason Goes to Hell, my first thought was, okay, um, first thing, <laughs> if, if there's a guy who's killed over a hundred people in a one mile radius, um, that's no longer a local law enforcement issue. That's a federal issue. So that's why we had the FBI go and get him. Two, if this kid died and his mother was so grief stricken that she would murder teenagers just to keep the camp closed, just to stop them from, from any other death of any child, if that's her modus operandi, if everything is about her dear Jason, great. Wouldn't she at some point turn to the dark arts? to try to resurrect her child. So wouldn't she go and search out the Necronomicon? Wouldn't she read from it? Wouldn't she try to resurrect her child? Now imagine if she gets the Necronomicon, does this, and Jason wakes up in the middle of Crystal Lake. Now here's the thing, Jason is mentally handicapped. Well, okay. He doesn't know where he is. He's scared. He's stuck in the dark down in the in, in this water. He doesn't know to go to mom. He has no idea. He's just there. And of course, he is now something else. He is a deadite or a revenant or something, but he's something under that lake. Now, the camp's been closed for all these years. She comes back in 1980, murders all these people, and then by the edge of the lake... Jason witnesses Alice kill his mother. Out of his rage and fury, he jumps up, drags Alice down, right? Well, now you've got a spirit of vengeance. Now you've got this creature that's learning and it's got rage. It's not just, it, it, Jason isn't just born bad. He wasn't a bad kid when he died. He was just a sweet little boy. Well, now he's watched his mother get decapitated. And now everyone must die because his mother is dead. And you've got this added idea that the evil dead, that that presence, that that idea, that the Necronomicon has filled Jason with something from, from the depths of hell. So now he's hell's assassin. Well, by the way, that would explain how a little boy becomes a huge man in two weeks. Now I buy that. Now I go, okay, cool. Now we're dealing with magic. Now we're dealing with, with the evil dead. Anything is possible. And this allows for the timeline to make sense. So here's the thing. I couldn't, I couldn't just talk about the evil dead in the movie because we didn't own the rights. New Line didn't have the rights to it. But right. at the time, when I, was, when I was writing the movie and prepping the movie, um, the, the K&B guys, Bob Kurtzman specifically, they were working on... Uh, on um, Army of Darkness with Sam Raimi. So they invited me to the set for a few days and I went to hang out. I actually helped puppeteer a couple of things. It was freaking awesome. Um, but I was 22 at the time uh, and Bob Kurtzman and Howard Berger and Greg and I were all becoming really good friends. And so I said to Bob, I told him what I wanted to do. I said, do you think Sam would let me borrow the Necronomicon for the movie? And he's like, I don't know, let's ask. So we asked Sam, Sam hands me the Necronomicon in a Ziploc bag. I kid you not, just hands it to me. <laughs> Bring it back when you're done. So between that and then of course the dagger as well, I wanted those items in the room knowing this is my mythology. This is, this is how this all makes sense to me. I can't explicitly say the evil dead, but what I can do is hint all over the place at it and hope that the fans follow me and go, oh my God, 
Mrs. Voorhees was called was using the Necronomicon to resurrect her son. Hence, we have this monster. Right. So that was the idea behind it. Right. So, uh, you know, most people just like theorize about, oh, maybe there's going to be like a Freddy versus Jason versus Ash, you know, but it's actually like just they, changing the th would. timeline. Yeah, I wish they would. I, I, look, I wish because, you know, when I when I was when I was a little kid, one of the coolest things I had ever seen was when um, I don't know if you guys if you watched Scooby Doo at all as a kid, but when Scooby Doo was on, okay, so y you know the premise, right? It's this dog and these yeah. kids that solve mysteries, right? Okay, so in the uh, early '80s, there was suddenly an episode of Scooby Doo where Batman showed up, and to my little mind, I was like. Oh my God, Batman knows Scooby Doo? Like suddenly. <laughs> and then, like a few weeks later, the Harlem Globetrotters showed up with Scooby Doo. I was like, all of these characters live in the same world? And that's kind of the way I started to think about, about Friday the 13th, because here's, my, here's the biggest problem I have with horror movies in general. And of course, Scream, years, two years later, kind of, you know, laughed in the face at this. But why is it that everybody in a horror movie has never seen a horror movie? They do all the stupid shit that we go, don't do that. You know, don't go into the dark woods alone. Don't split up. Don't go into the attic. Leave the haunted house. Like, they, they, nobody ever behaves like they've ever seen a horror movie. So my right. thing was, what if, you know, Leatherface and Michael Myers and Ash and Freddy all live in the same universe of Friday the 13th. And that allows for a lot of more battle royales, without a doubt, but it allows for a logic that makes more sense for the characters to behave the way the characters behave. So that was kind of the impetus for that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I like that idea. Thanks, um, right. Now, now it even makes sense for me because I, I, I never really <laughs> mm -hmm. knew what, what happened there in like those two weeks yeah. you know the only other way you could explain it is if the they were like actual campfire tales with like a jason you know right which and, by the way it's interesting that's what sean cunningham sean cunningham originally wanted friday 13th to be tales about the worst the the, the most unlucky day of the year he didn't want it to be about jason Voorhees. he wanted it to be right. separate tales the same way that john carpenter wanted tales of halloween not tales about michael myers it's the same idea. Yeah, so you could also kind of look at it as tales with Jason Voorhees in a camp, you know, and everything is like different. And that's why the right. timeline doesn't make sense. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, what are which, some... by, which, by the way, all stems from the Cropsy with the Cropsy legend, um, which have you ever seen the burning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. So the burning, that story is really where the Jason mythos comes out of, um, because Cropsy is a is a is a famous sort of campfire tale in in the United States, where you know kids that go to camp hear the Cropsy story. Here's another interesting thing. So if you've seen the burning, the character uh, of Eddie, who is the um, uh, he gets killed on the raft. He's the guy who takes the girl out to the lake and tries to get fresh with her, and she w walks away from him. That's All my right. uncle Ned. That's my uncle Ned. <laughs> that's cool yeah he's an amazing actor he's been working for like 40 years now in the business and he's he's literally works every day of his life um he's like in every third law and order episode he's that guy uh and if you saw him you're like oh that guy i know that guy yeah he's that guy um but that's my uncle uh that's cool yeah um uh, what are some of your own favorite horror movies um you know it's interesting i i get asked that a lot here's the thing there are the pantheon of the greatest horror movies ever made, and you, you have to give those the credit first because there's look, no one's ever going to make another Exorcist. It's never going to happen. I always love when people like when Hereditary came out. They're like the scariest movie since The Exorcist. I'm like, oh stop, just stop it. <laughs> um, it no, it's not. Um, so The Exorcist is the, the the granddaddy. It just is. Um, I love the original Texas Chainsaw. I just think that movie is yes, yeah. <laughs> it's it, it it because it it what it did was it took this documentary camera and 
placed it in this horror story so that you felt that this is actually happening, that you're watching what really happened. That's so unnerving. It's such a, it's such a brilliant piece of filmmaking. Um, so definitely Texas Chainsaw. Jaws, I think, is a perfect horror film. Um, I think it's I think it's probably the best directed horror film of all time. Um, interestingly enough, I think that William Friedkin, you know, he gets all this credit for 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 Exorcist. What he doesn't get credit for is a movie that I find to be just as frightening, but in a completely different way, which is Cruising. Um, I'm a huge oh, yeah, fan. I, of that. I've right? heard of that one, but I haven't seen it yet. Oh, it's so good. And it's the thing is, if you think of it as a horror film, it's like a whole other thing. Um, it's really brilliant. It's a great film. Um, so I'm a huge fan of that. Uh, when it comes to like more modern horror, I'm a giant fan of 2008, the 2008 French version of Inside. Um, I think that's a remarkable film. Um, one of the most disturbing I've ever seen and female driven, which I find awesome right, right up front. I just think that's really cool. Um, I love that movie. Um, I, I'm, I'm, uh, it's interesting. Like I love things like the witch. I think that's a great movie. Um, even though it's in this weird period of horror that we talked about earlier, where like everything is sad. Yeah. Um, but I, but I do love that movie because I think that, I think that Eggers takes us to a place that we've never been before and explores it so fully, um, and creates a world that feels honest so that that ending is like, oh my God. I mean, you just, you just don't see it coming. So I, I love that. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, here's the thing. And by the way, the evil dead incredible and evil dead 2 right. even more incredible like those are <laughs> yeah. perfect fucking movie they're amazing so uh my look my tastes are look i love extreme horror i also love horror comedies like Shaun of the dead is you know it doesn't get better or funnier than that movie it's 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 really extraordinary so yeah i'm um no i, I i'm telling you, man i'm uh I'm a fan of our genre. I love my genre. I love horror movies um, because the thing, and the thing is like, I'm known for horror movies and comedies. That's usually what I'm known for. And, and the thing is both of those things have commonalities. Um, both are better in a theater. They're theater experiences because mm -hmm. when people scream yeah. and they all scream together, I can tell you like one of my favorite moments ever, ever, uh, was we were showing Jason Goes to Hell for the first audience um, in downtown Los Angeles. And we screened the movie and seven minutes in the corner, or maybe eight minutes in, the corner eats the heart. There was a guy in the third row who threw up. <laughs> I, I've never felt more accomplished in my life. I was like, <laughs> right. yeah! You know, because because here's the thing. It's all about reaction. It's all about how does it make somebody feel? So comedy and horror both work the same way. Horror movies, it's usually a scream. Comedies, it's hopefully a laugh. And that becomes infectious for the audience. That becomes the fun for them. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I love our genre, man. And, and, and again, like I have so many. I mean, The Thing is 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 a masterpiece. The, right. the Shining yeah. is a piece and by the way i really liked um what mike flanagan did with dr sleep like i think that's a really badass movie especially the long oh, version yeah it's really good see the long I... version see the director's cut it's better um rebecca ferguson gives an unbelievable performance in that movie it's it's extraordinary um and look by the way like i think hereditary um is a really good movie until the third act but the first two acts of that movie, I think, are terrific and unnerving. And like, where is this going? I really hoped it was going in one direction and it went in another direction. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, it went in a direction that was just ripping off other movies where if 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 he had finished the thought. Um, have you ever seen uh, The Strange Thing About the Johnsons? Uh, no, I have not. Okay, it's on YouTube. It's his student, it's not a student film, it's a short film. 
Um, it's the same same director. It's Ari Aster's short film. Right. It's, to my opinion, it's still the best thing he's ever made. It's unbelievable. It's scary. It's unnerving. It's unsettling. It's really good. And it completes its thought. And my big problem with, 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 with his stuff is that I think he's an insanely talented guy. I just wish he would finish his thought instead of cheapen out at the end. Give us a cheap ending. Right. Give us the give us the complicated. Give us the tough ending, um, because he's great at giving us a tough beginning. He just doesn't want to give us the tough ending. So <laughs> uh, you know, uh, oh look, naked people chanting. Okay, I got it. I got it. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm uh, look, dude. I'm I'm a huge fan uh, of horror in general. I just watched a movie last night. Um, have you seen? Um, uh, uh, we need to talk about Kevin. No. It's Tilda Swinton, um, it, and it's a it's a pretty amazing movie, and it was a kind of a bigger movie. But there's a wonderful new movie that I just saw, literally just watched last night, called Mom, uh, which is Mothers of Monsters. It's an acronym, and uh, it's about a mother who's terrified that her child uh, is going to kill everybody in his school, and it is truly just about this mom trying to figure out if her son is a sociopath. It's really cool, really cool. And it, I'm telling you, it was made maybe for a hundred grand, uh, <laughs> but, but it's really good. It's a good movie. Um, so again, budget doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters, especially anymore. It's really, what is the thought you have? Like, what are you trying to say? And do you say it effectively? So right. yeah, I'm, I'm uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's I think it's a really good time for horror right now. I think there's a lot of people who are able to make things. The problem is, is that because you can shoot so cheaply, there's a ton of people making stuff who have no business making anything, who don't know how to make <laughs> it. You know? So we get inundated with a lot of crap. But I also think there's a lot of like really cool, like little nuggets of genius out there. Um, I don't know if you've seen the platform yet, which is, you know, this huge hit on Netflix. I have heard of it. It's really good. It's really good. And it's, you know, it's a, it's sci-fi-ish, but it's also a horror movie. Um, so, yeah, dude, I, I, just think there's a, I just think there's so much good stuff out there right now. And I think we're getting more and more of it because people have access to filmmaking materials that they never had before. Right. Yeah, that brings me to my next question. Uh, what are some of, uh, what's an advice you can give to young and upcoming filmmakers? <laughs> um, make movies, make movies. And honestly, and don't start with a feature film. Like everybody wants to go from zero to 60 in one shot, make short films, write short films, um, learn what a two act structure is before you run to make a three act structure. Um, if you have a, if you have a feature film you want to make, that's awesome. But write the short version of it first, write like a two C do a scene from that. Do a scene from your feature film. Learn how to use the camera. Learn how to talk to actors. Honestly, the actor thing is, I think, the biggest mistake that everybody makes. Because if you look at a lot of first films, first films from directors, the acting is usually awful because they've never learned how to talk to an actor. Like, right. I don't understand a director that learns everything they can about the lenses, about the different cameras, about lighting. You're going to have a DP who handles your lighting. You don't have to you don't have to know that chapter and verse. It's better if you do. It's better if you know all your lenses. You need to eventually, but it that's really why you have a DP. The one thing that nobody's allowed to do but you is talk to those actors. Right. Leave those actors in your story. So for me, you know, when a, when a filmmaker goes to make a movie, you you know, <laughs> the screenplay is your paint. The actors are your brushes. And if you don't know how to deal with those two items skillfully, you're never going to succeed. You will fail. Um, so I think that learning those things, learning how to tell story, learning what good story is, which is where the screenplay comes in, and then learning how to tell that story through performance. And actors have a language that is not like other people. It's not like you have to understand their language, which is purely about emotion and about going to places that most people would be terrified to go to. Um, 
you know, can you imagine, I mean, you're an actor in a horror movie and you have to be scared. Look at the, the first Texas Chainsaw, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. She is terrified for 40 minutes. She is screaming for 40 minutes of that movie. Do you know how hard that is on a human body? Because that 40 minutes took two weeks to shoot. Right. So you're terrified for two weeks? Can you even think of a time in your life that you were terrified for that long? It doesn't happen. I mean, I've been terrified for three and a half years with Donald Trump as president. But <laughs> but, but, but to have that be concentrated in, in one area of time um, is very difficult. And, uh, and being sensitive enough to the actor to understand how to get that from them. Um, that's, uh, that's a very heavy skill set. So, you know, film, look, the other thing I would say for young filmmakers is look, feature films are three acts are three act structure. Okay. I know there's a lot of other theories about this, but it, it's a three act structure. You have a first act. that's usually about 30 pages. You have a second act. that's usually about 50 pages. And then you've got a third act. that's usually about 15 pages. Okay, great. So take that structure and utilize it for your three act movies. A short film is a two act structure. That's it. A short film, you have to think of it like a joke. It's set up punchline. That's it. That's the whole, that's, that's the whole arc. And if you think of your, of your short film as a punchline, as a joke, you can't go wrong. Um, look at, I'm sure you've seen the film Lights Out, right? The, the short film that it was based on? Yeah. Great, okay. It's a great short movie and it's scary. It's actually legit scary, which is why they got to make the feature length movie, which there are other problems with. But that, <laughs> that short movie, it's all like set up, set up, build, 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 lights out. And right. that's how it works. So um, I would implore people like wh when you are, when you're making short films, don't try to tell a three act structure. Don't give me a setup, a middle section and an ending. That's a feature and your short's gonna feel truncated. It's not gonna feel as satisfying. If you just go with setup punchline, it'll be so satisfying. And then, and honestly, look, here's the other thing um, for anybody who wants to write and direct or who just wants to write screenplays, your first five screenplays are going to be terrible. They're going to be terrible. I, I know everybody thinks their first screenplay is the best thing that has ever been written ever in the history of writing. I know. I thought that too. I was the same guy. <laughs> um, your first five scripts you have to put into a drawer, close it, and lock it. And 10 years from then, you can go and look at those again. And by the way, if you're still writing at that point, you will read those first five screenplays and you will laugh your ass off at how <laughs> like I look at my earliest stuff and I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> right. I understood how to make it look like a screenplay just because it looks like a screenplay and your mom likes it does not make it a movie. <laughs> so, you know, all of this stuff, what, what I'm basically saying is, you know, San, uh, Sanford Meisner, who is one of the greatest acting gurus to ever ever work in our industry. Sandy Meisner once said, it takes 20 years to become an actor from the moment you start training. And the truth is, think about it, you know, when you've got a doctor who's fresh out of med school, do you want that doctor doing your brain surgery? No. No. <laughs> no. You want the woman in her mid 40s who's been out of med school for 20 years. You want her doing your brain surgery. Right. You know why? Yeah. She's done a lot of practice already. She's really good now, <laughs> you know? So that's the thing. It's, it's, it's um, because it's art, we think the inspiration is all that matters. And, and by the way, there are exceptions to the rule. There are people like Chris Columbus, you know, was writing gremlins in film school, you know, and it's genius. Sure, that right. happened. But for the preponderance of artists out there, you have to practice to get great, you know? And um, it takes time and don't rush it, just keep practicing. Because again, writing is rewriting. That's the only way to really become a great writer is to, is to take notes on your precious perfect script 
<laughs> and actually make it better and make it better and make it better and make and that's that's the trick yeah plus a lot of patience to it yeah yeah you shouldn't think that the first one is going to be the best thing ever you know uh and you know, have patience yep yep 100 percent. all right and then one more question if there was another big horror character uh, that you could write and direct a movie to, uh, what character would it be? It's interesting. I've been offered, I've been offered a lot of sequels. Um, I was offered, uh, two, sorry, three pumpkin head movies. Uh, no, sorry. Three leprechaun movies and a pumpkin head movie. Um, I was offered the, uh, a couple of, uh, Amityville sequels. Uh, Deb and I did, um, a pitch for the Weinsteins on Hellraiser at one point. Uh, we were offered to do the remake of The Omen, which we turned down. We turned down all of these. All of these we turned down. Um, I got to tell you, I'm really excited to see what they're doing with with Candyman. Um, because I think that's... Oh, okay. Yeah, because, you know, Jordan Peele just just produced the new one. But that was a character I would have really been interested in, in exploring. I think there's something really cool there. Um, and what I like about Candyman is that there's a racial issue to it, that it actually deals with something political that, that I get excited about. Right. Um, yeah, so, so that kind of works in my kind of the way my brain works. Um, I, I do love that character. I will say, I think that if someone could really figure out how to make Hellraiser work, I think that would be amazing. I think I think Pinhead is a really undervalued, underutilized character. Um, this idea of you know Hell's demons, um, I, I find that really sexy and 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 freaking cool. So, but again, I'm telling you, I think there's too many sequels. I think there's too many reboots. I think that we need movies that are original and that are exciting about like a new character. Like I don't know why people. I don't know why people don't come up with new new villains. Like there are a few, but only a few. Um, you know, when yeah. when you look at the, when you look at the It movies, which I don't think are are great. I think they're fine. But look how excited everybody is about Pennywise. I'm like, all it takes is a little bit of money and some good actors, and suddenly we'll have other villains that we can play yeah. with. You know, or look at uh, uh, Terrifier. I don't know if you've seen that one. I have. I have seen it. And in fact, um, the lead of that movie and I just did a podcast two days ago together. Um, and oh, David? Uh, no, Jenna, the girl. Oh, the girl. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, so yeah, people have this, like, they want new stuff. It's why Terrifier is something that people are talking about because they want new characters. And, um, but I will say this. Because I, I get asked this a lot. If I was to make another Jason movie, right? Because people are desperate for hockey mask. Um, <laughs> the movie I would make, uh, I would take Creighton Duke, um, who I've always said does not die at the end of Jason Goes to Hell. He His back is broken, but he does not die. Um, I would take Creighton Duke and uh, with a back brace, right? Old with a back brace and a cane and a... Um, and I would get him to assemble uh, a squad of guys a la Predator and hunt Jason down. Um, to me, a, a, a Friday 13th that looks like Predator, that would be fucking badass. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And it's something different because I know that if they do another Friday 13th movie, they are going to start off with the roots, you know, just like teenagers going to camp. And yeah. then like in 10 years, it's it's so dated, you know. It will work so now because everyone will want to see more, you know. But like in 10 years, it's going to be dated. Well, look, I mean, I think, I think the whole Halloween thing is... I just think it's unfortunate. <laughs> I do. I, 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 you know, I... I, I I know there are a lot of people who love who love the remake, uh, not the remake, but the the retcon. Um, and uh, I think Halloween one is a masterpiece. I think Halloween two is a fantastic film, the original Halloween two. Um, yeah. 
I, I got to tell you, I do, I do not understand the new one. I don't, I don't get it. I don't get why people like it. I don't get it. Um, <laughs> I, I just kind of scratch my head at it going, um, none of this makes sense. Not logical sense and not horror movie sense. Um, they've turned Laurie into a character that's completely unrelatable that I don't care about. And the dialogue is... I, I never heard worse dialogue. No one in this country calls their grandmother grandmother. <laughs> well, thank you for calling grandmother. What? I mean, I, I don't I don't get it at all. Um, and I don't find it scary at all. And Michael Myers suddenly became like a magical, mythical creature who can show up anywhere at any time. I, I, I just like, wow, we replaced Halloween 2 for this? why right yeah you know and why and why take away from the audience that that michael myers is related to 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 laurie strode like let us have that that's a great thing that they're related that's terrifying like your brother is coming for you great that's scary so i just i i don't get it but but that's really too to each their own like if people love Um, it they love it that's awesome you know yeah, I enjoy it for what it is, but, like, uh, I agree with you that it's, like, it's just another Halloween movie, you know? It wouldn't be remembered in, like, actual cinema history like the first one, you know? I couldn't agree more. Could not <laughs> agree more. Big time. Uh, do you have any final words for an interview? Uh, well, first off, it was great hanging with you, brother. This was this was really lovely, and uh, you you have a nice kind of like conversational style, which is really good. So it's right. I don't feel like I'm like just answering questions, which is great. Um, I gotta say, look, uh, what I would say is, you know, to everybody out there that y- your followers and your listeners, um, you know, I was very lucky that I got the break that I got when I was so young. I had been working since I was 11. Um, in the industry. So, you know, I had already been in it for 12 years, so I wasn't brand new to all of it. Um, But I do have to say, you know, dream big, like go for, go for what you want to go for. And if you're, if you're a storyteller, if you want to tell stories and it's all you can do with your life, it's what you see doing with your, with the time that you have on this earth, um, go for it. Like, don't let anybody tell you no, don't let anybody make you feel dumb for it or weird for it that and especially if you want to tell horror movies like it's real easy to have our parents and have people that you know oh you're wasting your time on that nonsense right (laughs) no i've built my whole life out of that nonsense and i have a wonderful life because of that nonsense and so um yeah i would just i would just advise anybody out there who has a dream to to tell stories tell them yeah, to some people, that's, like, demotivating when people tell you you can do it. But to me, it's just like, oh, I can't do it? Well, I'm going to prove you wrong, man. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Yeah. You're right. You're right. And that's the spirit that actually makes great horror movies. Because whenever right. you tell you that's not going to work, and you're like, yeah, yeah, I'll show you. Because I'll tell you something. Sean Cunningham turned Wes Craven down for A Nightmare on Elm Street. Wow. <laughs> Wes Craven brought Nightmare on Elm Street to Sean, and Sean said, this is stupid. Who's going to, oh, you're scared of your dream. Oh, it's going to get you in your dream. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, didn't he bring it up to, like, like a ton of studios, and then, then like, New Line Cinema was kind of this, like, small company, and was like, I... please buy my script. <laughs> yep, yep. And it's it's knowing it when you're when you're completely – sure of the story you want to tell that's infectious and eventually people will will back you and they will make your movie so it's it's all about having that that bravery um because that's that's everything in filmmaking it's everything all right yeah hey thanks a lot for the uh well a little motivation here uh that was all for the uh (laughs) <laughs> that was all for the interview and uh, see you guys next time see ya you're pissing me off Roger <laughs> 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 <laughs>